Good evening, uh, council members, and good evening to the public and those of you who are watching on social media or by other means. This is our first uh, regular council meeting in February, and obviously it is being conducted uh, virtually. So um, just a couple of things I need to mention uh, up front because we are meeting virtual tonight. Uh, since it's conducted as a remote meeting pursuant to North Carolina Sessions Law 2020-3, whenever a council member cannot be seen on the screen, that member will identify him or herself by name prior to asking questions uh, or participating in deliberations or making motions, proposing amendments, and voting. So council members, uh, be aware of that uh, uh, with your uh, with your video um activity there at other times you can uh, mute yourself but don't forget to unmute when the time uh, comes for you to speak as as a result of that uh, we will be doing our voting tonight by roll call so um, that's another item that is required under this statute uh, so at this point in time i'm going to ask our town clerk uh, to uh, call the roll to begin our meeting okay mayor marshburn i am present Mayor Pro Tem Berenger? Here. Councilmember Dellinger? Here. Councilmember Matthews? Here. Councilmember Samuelson? Here. And Councilmember Vance? Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clerk. I declare that we have a quorum. Everybody is present this evening, so thank you, uh, Council Members, for being present. As is our custom, we begin our meetings uh, with a Pledge of Allegiance and also an invocation. And so I'm going to call on Council Member Matthews, if he will, to uh, lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, of the United States, States, of States of America. America. And to, the and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God. Under God. Indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. And um, I will call on you now uh, for the uh, invocation, sir. I'm on, sir. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of gift of life, Lord. We thank you for being with our community and our town. And we ask for wisdom as we deliberate on issues that will impact our town at present and future. Grant us wisdom, grant us discernment to make those right decisions. Be with our country, be with our military. And Lord, we just ask for protection against this virus. It's soon it'll be a situation that's far behind us due to the vaccine and all the preparations that we're doing. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matthews for that. Okay, uh, the first uh, next item on the uh, agenda is uh, under the heading of petitions and comments. And so we have a provision if a person would like to make uh, uh, a comment uh, that that information needs to be given to our town clerk uh, by a certain time in the afternoon. And we do um, have one um, comment that was handed to me and I'm going to read it uh, for the uh, record. Mr. Um, Mayor, may, I, may yes. I make a comment about that? I, yes, sir. I, I think that, um, let me let me put my video on. I believe the item you have is concerning potential recognition of a person that's yet to retire. Correct. So I think we might be better just looking into that because that, 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 email you have or petition yes. is wanting us to maybe honor that person in a certain way so i don't know if we ought to read that um right now um okay because I'm, I'm not sure the person knows that request has been made so um but i guess just for the general public someone is requesting that we recognize a employee that's going to be retiring in a few months in a special way and uh, we'll need to check into seeing if that's feasible so, but, and I talked to um, Attorney Jones about that, and she feels that would be good enough announcement for that petition. Okay, okay. So, uh, and there have been some email exchanges uh, with 
uh, Mr. Lee, and so those uh, will also will follow up on, and uh, we'll handle uh, that matter uh, at a future meeting for sure. Okay. Correct. So, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Gibson, were there any other, I, I don't believe there were any other persons who signed up for comments this evening. Am I correct on that? You are correct. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we will now go to the item on our agenda where uh, you're asked to adopt the agenda as has been prepared and all of you have that. So at this point, it will be proper to uh, have a motion to adopt our agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Moved properly by uh, Ms. Beringer and seconded by Mr. Matthews. Um, if you will, as the roll is called, uh, please, uh, please uh, cast your vote. Mayor Pro Tem Berenger? Aye. Councilmember Dellinger? Aye. Councilmember Matthews? Aye. Councilmember Singleton? Aye. And Councilmember Vance? Aye. Okay, thank you all so very much. Uh, so we've approved our regular agenda. Um, as you will notice, uh, we have uh, a couple, two or three, maybe two items under presentations this evening. And so um, the first item, it's my uh, privilege to recognize our um, fire chief, Mr. Matthew Poole, who has a uh, very special presentation for someone in his department. So, uh, Chief Poole, I will recognize you at this time, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Don't have video on you. If that's available, we'd be pleased to have that, but if that's yeah. not possible. Our video is on. It may take a second. Um, I'm sorry. We see you now. I do. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me tonight, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, just a, a, a brief uh, presentation for tonight. Uh, Ms. Beringer had asked several months ago that we uh, recognize Battalion Chief Barrett Penny on an accomplishment that he was awarded uh, at the end of the year. So I have uh, Chief Penny here tonight, and I just briefly want to go over um, what events led up to uh, Chief Penny receiving our Medal of Valor. Uh, several months ago, as most of you are aware, the, the Garner Fire Rescue, among with many other departments, will provide an aid to the Clayton Fire Department. Um, but as, as you all know, the Clayton Fire Department, had a large number of their firefighters uh, become ill with the COVID virus. And so uh, a lot of us stepped up and covered their district for uh, several days while they could rest and recuperate and get back to duty. One of our responsibilities as the Garner Fire Department was to provide a chief officer um, to act as the Clayton Battalion Chief during this time frame. While providing coverage, it was never expected that we would respond to any of the out of ordinary call types such as technical rescues. But little did we know uh, the night Chief Penny was working, Johnson County received a record amount of rainfall and they had many flash flooding incidences throughout the area. Chief Barrett Penny, while acting as the battalion chief of the Clayton Fire Department, responded to a swift water rescue incident and he served as the commanding officer alongside the uh, Cary Fire Department who was uh, filling in as Clayton firefighters. Four victims were pulled from the top of a flooded car in swift water. If it were not for the heroic actions taken by the crew and Chief Penny, lives could have been lost, including that of a small child. Chief Penny had, that night had everything stacked against him. He was commanding a crew of four firefighters that he had ne never met before. He was responding in an unfamiliar district. He was having to utilize different radios and CAD systems and also different equipment from another department. All of these challenges were overcome that night. Chief Penny did not hesitate to lead, guide, and direct the life-saving efforts of this water rescue operation. Our Deputy Fire Chief Tim Herman responded to the incident that evening and personally saw the events unfold. He felt compelled to share what he had witnessed and recommended Chief Penny receive the Garner Fire Rescue Medal of Valor. Uh, and I want to express to you that Chief Penny is the first person to ever receive this award in our department. So I'm here tonight to congratulate Chief Penny and share with you that he has received our Medal of Valor 
uh, for a water rescue call while serving as the incident commander for the Clayton Fire Department. Thank you so much, uh, Chief, and um, uh, a good uh, background explanation of his um, the reason for awarding this. And to um, to Chief Penny, I'd like to personally uh, thank you for your service to our town and to the fire department and for uh, such uh, exemplary uh, acts of courage and bravery. Uh, this is this award is well deserved and certainly is a is a high honor as the chief has mentioned. So uh, I congratulate you, sir. And uh, at this point, I'll see if other council members have any comments they want to make. But thank you for coming in this evening and letting us uh, letting us recognize you, sir. And uh, before we finish, we'll be happy to hear from you as well. But uh, any council members uh, care to uh, offer any uh, words of commendation? I'll start with Mr. Matthews. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As a former volunteer fireman and first responder, I've seen this department come a long way from the days of a big siren behind Hudson's Hardware, which I know Mr. Singleton heard many of a time, and uh, everybody f going to the station to answer the call. And as we progressed uh, and, and have grown, and of course with the training, and we've seen so many personnel changes as the young guys now have stepped up. And and one of them happens to be the chief, and I remember him back in those days. But as uh, uh, far as Chief Penny, Sir, this is a great recognition because the fire department does a lot more than just put out fires. They cut people out of cars. They got water rescue and so much. And so much depends on these firemen, the training. And every time they leave home to go to work, they never know the families if they're going to make it back that night or that day. And and this speaks so well of you and your leadership capabilities. And uh, Chief Poole and Chief Penny, I just want to congratulate you. And uh and wish you well. I think you've got a great future and you well deserve this award. And you represent Garner and the Garner Fire Department, the Brotherhood, very well. And congratulations. And uh, Chief Poole, I'm glad to see we're recognizing Chief Penny and, uh, and uh, for a job outstanding and well done. And way to go. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. I recognize Mr. Singleton for any comments he cares to make. Yes, I want to congratulate Barrett for uh, winning this recognition. I also like to thank him for accepting the responsibility of stepping up and taking this leadership role, working with other uh, firefighters who you weren't familiar with. Obviously, y'all worked as a team to uh, complete this rescue. So congratulations uh, for your hard work. Congratulations for all the training and uh, certification that you've had to go through to get to this point because that uh, allowed you to step up and, and be a leader. So I want to congratulate you for your hard work and for being recognized and thank you for your service. Okay, uh, Ms. Beringer. Uh, yes, so well, I'd like to, say, of course, thank Barrett for the good work he's done, but I'd also like to, to point out that this happened several months ago. Uh, Barrett's a, a, a busy person and hard to catch up with sometimes. So I kept asking uh, when we were gonna do this and, and I was told, well, Barrett's schedule is, not, is conflicting. Um, so we're finally here, and Barrett, we just want to say to you that um, you represent Garner well. We are proud, proud of you, and proud to be able to call you our own. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Vance. Oh yes, uh, 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 Mr. Penny. Thank you so much for your service, your selfless service. Uh, you placed yourself in the position of danger. And to do what you did is the miraculous, and you you definitely deserve the honor that you're receiving. And as everyone has already said, uh, you uh, definitely doing God a great job. And thank you so much for going into uh, Clayton and 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 then representing God well. Your service is really appreciated, and we thank you greatly. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dellinger, any comments? I'll just repeat the sentiments of my fellow council members and, and express my gratitude um, for your, your hard work and your years of training and, and your representation of Garner. And I'm sure the family is, is very thankful as well. Um, like I say, you just thank you for representing uh, the town well, and we appreciate you. Okay. Thank you, council members. Um, and again, uh, 
Chief Penny, um, we are indebted to you for your service. Uh, if you'd like to make any uh, comments, uh, sir, we'd be happy to hear from you. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, members of council and May Mayor Marshall, Chief Poole, uh, I'm honored to uh, have received the award, but I would be remiss if I did not uh, relay that there were some guys and, and firefighters and women that night that I saw do things that were above and beyond the call of duty in all ranks. So while I may have had the assignment of being the incident commander and overseeing the operation, it was a group effort and it was a lot of risk involved for several people to uh, to affect the rescue. So I just want to echo that, that, it, you know, thank you, I'm honored. But at the same time, it was, it was, uh, it was a situation that I watched people go above and beyond in all ranks. Again, thank you for the time. Thank you for the recognition. Okay, sure. Um, well stated and, uh, and and well done. Again, thank you, Chief, uh, for uh, arranging uh, this presentation this evening. And uh, maybe uh, in the coming days, some of us will have a chance to see Chief uh, Penny in person and to uh, congratulate him that way. But for now, we'll have to do it virtually, Chief. Uh, thank you both for coming in. So, Thank you. Okay, at this time we have uh, our next presentation, which will uh, uh, be different. It'll be a financial, uh, excuse me, an audit report, but I'm going to recognize our finance director, Mr. David Beck, who will um, introduce our guests for this uh, uh, segment of the agenda. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, David Beck, town finance director here. It's a uh, a privilege to introduce uh, tonight Mr. Tim Lyons, who is a partner with our audit firm, Malden and Jenkins. Uh, Mr. Lyons works out of the Columbia, South Carolina office and was the lead auditor uh, on our engagement this year. Uh, so we worked with uh, he and his team. Uh, this year was a little different. Uh, we had more of a, it was sort of a mix of in-person and, um, and remote auditing. Um, they were really flexible with their clients and, um, and kind of, uh, you know, figured out a way to do it that, that worked best for us. And so we appreciate uh, their flexibility with us this year. Uh, it was a good, uh, a good process to work through the audit with them uh, as it has been in prior years. And um, we're pleased that uh, the audit report uh, came back um, with what's known as a, a clean uh, report and opinion. We, uh, we got the desired um, unmodified opinion and uh, did not have any audit findings to report. So uh, I'm pleased with that and appreciate the, uh, the work of my entire staff in the finance department uh, who assisted with uh, preparing the books at fiscal year end and getting ready for the audit and uh, working to get documents together as part of that. Um, so with that intro, I will turn it over to Mr. Lyons if he is ready to take over from here. Thanks, David. I uh, appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I was going to try to share my screen, but I don't. Uh... Oh, here we go. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. We yes. Have the... All right. Yeah. Great. So what I've got here just real quick to go through, I know you all have a um, uh, a full agenda tonight, so I don't want to take up too much uh, of your time, but um, just a quick little presentation that we like to do um, to more presenting the results of the audit to the governing boards. Um, just real quickly, we'll go over, you know, kind of the engagement team, the results of the audit. We have a couple of slides on uh, some financial trends that I think are important and like to kind of point out, uh, and then a couple of comments and recommendations, and certainly if, uh, if anybody has any questions or things that they'd like to talk about or ask me about, feel free to interject. Um, and I'll also have a slide at the end for it as well. Um, so real quickly, as, as, uh, as David introduced, my name is Tim Lyons. I served uh, as the engagement partner this year. Uh, Kyle Slovic, who is a member of my office, who is a CPA and uh, served as, as a senior associate with our firm and served as the engagement in charge. And then every audit at Malden and Jenkins, when, when the engagement team gets finished, uh, we send the audit and the audit file to another uh, partner, specifically for the town's audit. We would send the, the audit and the file uh, to another partner in our governmental practice, 
uh, and they do what's known as an engagement quality control review. They're going to go over um, and look over the, the file and the procedures and the reports, and make sure we've done everything that we needed to do. Uh, that this year was James Bentz, who actually served as the town's engagement partner for the last couple of years, and we've rotated him off um, this year. But James performed that independent quality control review. So that was that was our M and J team uh, this year on the audit. Um, as, as David mentioned earlier, uh, we did uh, issue an unmodified or clean opinion on, on your financial statements. There, uh, there's no better audit opinion they, that, that you can get. The, the unmodified opinion is, is what everyone strives for and what you need to have. Um, and, and I would just like to point out, in addition to the report on the financial statements, uh, because the town uh, is a governmental entity. We also have to issue two additional reports. One of them is our report on internal controls over financial reporting and on compliance in accordance with government auditing standards. This is the report that we look at internal controls over financial reporting. We perform certain tests of compliance with laws and regulations, other things that the um, that the state of North Carolina requires, among other things. And if we were to come across any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control or uh, instances of non-compliance, we would have to report those items as findings, um, as they are sometimes called. And in the government auditing standards report, um, we had no, no findings this year. So no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, no instances of non-compliance to report. We also issue a single audit report, which is the last report uh, in the town's comprehensive annual financial report, that big thick PDF document. Um, the last report is the single audit report. So while, while the town uh, did not have to have a federal single audit this year because expenditures of federal funds did not exceed the $750,000 threshold, the town did have to have a single audit in accordance with the North Carolina Single Audit Implementation Act for exceeding $500,000 in expenditures of state funds. And so we had to audit the town's expenditures of the patrol bill um, that is passed through the North Carolina DOT. And as a part of our testing and audit procedures, we issued an unmodified or a clean opinion on compliance. Uh, and again, we also had no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control over compliance. So uh, all in all, all three reports that we issued this year um, were, were very clean, unmodified opinions and no findings were reported. The next few slides are, are what are known in our um, auditing standards as the required communications. Uh, these are things that as the auditor, I'm, I'm required to inform uh, the, the, the town council that's charged with governance of the, of the governmental entity. Uh, because I'm submitting these to you in writing, I'm not gonna go through and read every single one of these, but um, I do think that there are a couple of these that are important. And so we'd just like to hit highlights of those. Um, you know, when we when we perform an audit, we do look at the accounting policies, uh, management's judgments, and its accounting estimates. Uh, and I think that, you know, when it comes to those types of things, I think it's important for us to communicate that when we when we consider all of those policies, uh, the estimates that management is using in preparing the financial statements, uh, we we noted that these these types of things are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, very common amongst. Uh, local governments in the state of North Carolina, and the town is not involved in any controversial or emerging accounting issues where there's no guidance. And so those things are important to know that the town's accounting policies and estimates are very comparable and consistent with what we would see with other governments in North Carolina. Uh, as David alluded to, we had a great working relationship with management, um, certainly no issues or disagreements to report to the board. Um, you know, this year with the unique situation we found ourselves in, we really appreciate David and his team and the way that we were able to work together to get the audit done in a in a remote uh, kind of hybrid fashion where we did uh, a good chunk of the work remotely, but then we were we were on site at the town for a couple of days. Uh, when it comes to the the actual audit adjustments that we posted during the audit, um, I think it's important to communicate to y'all that we had no past audit adjustments. So there were no adjustments that we came across during our audit procedures that we uh, decided not to post in the town's uh, financial statements. So every adjustment, which there was really only one that we came across, but any adjustments that we did identify have been posted and are reflected in the town's financial statements. 
Lastly, and I think this is probably the last one that I, I think is important enough to communicate to the board. I always think it's important for us to point out that we we are independent of the town. We, we have to be independent of the town in order to perform the role of the independent uh, accountant as the independent auditor. And so we meet the uh, AICPA's professional standards as well as the requirements for independence by government auditing standards. Um, and so we I always think that pointing out auditor independence is, is really important. Uh, just a couple of, uh, of trends that I think are important to point out um, when we, we kind of look at how fund balance, obviously your fund balance of the general fund, uh, probably one of the more important measures, things that I think certainly uh, that investors, the credit rating agencies will look at, look at the town's fund balance. And while you can see that that the unassigned amount of fund balance has sort of trended down a little bit over the last couple of years. The really the biggest uptick you're seeing is in that committed fund balance where the town council is, is using fund balance for specific projects or specific purposes. And so, you know, this is not any sort of a, a decrease in fund balance to be concerned about more just a, a changing in how fund balance is being classified. And when you consider that in accordance with this next slide, you know, I, I like to refer to this slide as financial leverage. And really what we mean by that is how, how able is the town to respond to fluctuations or, or changes in the timing of its revenues? A lot of times with governmental entities, what, what we can find is where governments get very dependent on future revenues to come in to be able to fund those operations and provide those cash flows. And what we see with the town at June 30th, 2020, is that roughly 75% of the town's annual expenditures are, are sitting in fund balance of the general fund at year end. About 34% is sitting in unassigned. And what that represents is a, is a really healthy fund balance position for the town, certainly well above and beyond what GFOA or other um, investor agencies or best practices would, would look at and say, hey, what is this town's fund balance? And so I think the general fund balance uh, of the town is uh, something to be something to be proud of, uh, but it also has on financial management uh, that has been exercised over the years. We did have one uh, recommendation when what is called our management letter. Um, this is the letter that we issue uh, in conjunction with the audit that just has to do with uh, comments, or recommendations, things that we think are important for the town to keep in mind and point out as they consider accounting uh, practices in the future years. Really what this pertains to is, is, is a adjustment we had to make during the audit. Um, it's a, it's a really just a, a, a technical accounting thing where we had an invoice that, that lapped over two different accounting periods. It was a little bit tricky to identify exactly how much of that invoice related to the period under audit. And so we ended up just having to post an adjustment to report accounts payable and expenditures of the capital projects fund. Certainly nothing to be overly concerned about. The amount was not material and it did not result in any sort of a finding, but just a recommendation for making sure that we review these types of things after year end, especially with the number of projects the town has going on and making sure that, that, that these types of things are being accounted for in the correct period. And, and last but not least, just a couple of slides. We've been trying to, to point out some things to just make sure everybody is aware of these. We will you know, certainly work with David and to make sure that these things are being picked up and uh, incorporated. Um, you know, we have a significant accounting standard, GASB Statement Number 84, that we will need to implement in the town's financial statements next year. Uh, after that, in June 30 of 2022, the leasing standard is very significant and will cause some pretty significant changes. And so we want just want the town to be aware and certainly the town management to be aware uh, of what's coming down the pipe from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. And lastly, um, just as a reminder, there is a lot of stimulus out there right now. Uh, the town is likely receiving the majority of its funding either being passed through Wake County or being passed through the state of North Carolina. But just to be aware of that the federal departments and agencies are continually up, updating guidance, frequently asked questions, and all, all kinds of things about how to spend these funds and the different requirements related to it. Uh, probably the biggest thing to point out at this time is that if the town does receive funding directly from the federal government, 
Uh, a lot of the stimulus that's out there has uh, a lot of significant um, reporting requirements under the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. So just some things for the town to be aware of and to keep in mind. Um, and with that, just one last reminder here, we do offer free quarterly continuing education for our governmental clients. Uh, we've been doing this uh, via Zoom for almost a year, trying to make it available to anybody who wants to join. So certainly if there's anybody uh, that would like to be added to our distribution list for this, uh, please uh, let me know. David has my contact information and we can certainly get you on uh, our distribution list for when we have classes coming up in the future. With that, I will um, stop sharing my screen here and am, am happy to take uh, any questions that uh, anybody from the town uh, on the meeting tonight may have for me. Okay, uh, Mr. Lyons, thank you very much uh, for being available for the meeting this evening and for your uh, uh, concise but uh, thorough report. And so at this point in time, I will uh, poll our council to see if there are questions uh, specific uh, either to the audit or to your presentation, which are sort of one and the same, aren't they? Um, so, uh, Mr. Dellinger, any uh, comments or questions, sir? Uh, no questions. Okay. Mr. Vance? Uh, no questions. All right. Mr. Matthews? No questions, sir. Okay. Mr. Singleton? No questions. Thank you for the report, Mr. Lyons. Okay. And, Thank uh, you. And Ms. Beringer. No questions. Okay. Um, well, again, I want to thank you for your good work and uh, thank David and his staff. Uh, obviously, they received a lot of kudos for the way they worked uh, with you and your company, Mr. Lyons. So that's uh, very commendable and uh, um, an expectation we as council members would have of that uh, department. So I want to thank uh, David um, as well. Uh, David, is there anything else uh, that you want to uh, say or comment on? Uh, uh, after Mr. Lyon's presentation? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to, to make a couple of comments. We do have um, bound hard copies of the audit report for each council member and yourself. Uh, we'll work on uh, getting that uh, to you all in some form or fashion. Uh, we'll also be uh, emailing out a PDF of the, the full report as well. And then for any of the uh, members of the general public who may be uh, watching the meeting tonight, the report is available on the town's website. Um, we also have uh, what's called the popular annual financial report, which is a, um, a very much boiled down version of the comprehensive financial report, uh, much easier to read uh, for folks and kind of gives you some high level um, uh, highlights from the the full report so uh, if anyone is interested in that that's out there as well and I appreciate the uh, the support of the council for our department and uh, if any questions come up later we'll be glad to, to help you with those okay thank you mr. Beck um, and I'll make a confession I a couple of nights ago uh, was sitting down to uh, read this particular section of the agenda and uh, as I was reading I soon discovered that uh, I didn't have the regular report in front of me uh, and then I realized in past years it's a rather a comprehensive document so you're alluding to this um, to this um, I've forgotten the name of it the minimal uh, report that we is, is a summary I guess uh, it'll be nice to get that and to, to, to read that uh, there may be some council members who want to read the entire report we'll see but uh, but uh, thank you for uh, preparing that as well. Yes, sir. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Lyons, I don't know uh, 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 what the weather's like down in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, but um, I, uh, I hope uh, things, are, things are well for you down there, sir. And um, again, um, thank you for a job well done. I, I appreciate that. Thank you all for having me on tonight. Okay. Thanks, sir. With that, uh, we'll excuse Mr. Lyons and... Um, Actually, the next item uh, is uh, related uh, to Mr. Beck's department also, but it's the one item on the consent agenda. So, Council, I need uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Consent agenda, motion made uh, to approve. So, uh, 
Mr. Clerk, if you'll uh, if you'll call the roll for uh, approval of the consent agenda. Councilmember Dellinger. Aye. Councilmember Matthews. Aye. Councilmember Singleton. Aye. Councilmember Vance. Aye. And Mayor Pro Tem Barringer. Aye. Thank you. The vote's unanimous, and so uh, it's so ordered. Uh, thank you all. Um, there are no public hearings tonight that I'm aware of. There are none listed on our agenda, so I'm going to move into the next item, which is new and old business. Um, and at this time, I will recognize Assistant Town Manager Matt Roy Lance, who will uh, make a presentation as it, rela as it relates to uh, uh, consulting services uh, for our fire merger. So, Mr. Roy Lance, you're up. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Town Council. I am glad to be here tonight and uh, also wanted to let you know that um, while I'll be doing most of the presentation, um, Chief Greg Grayson from North Carolina Fire Chief Consulting is, uh, is on the call as well and available if you have questions. And of course, uh, Chief Poole, who was involved in the earlier presentation, is here and several members of the MOU committee um, are, are also available if, if you do have questions. But, um, what I would like to do now is uh, go ahead and share my screen and we'll go through the presentation and talk about the, um, the consulting work that we are proposing to do as it relates to the merger. And if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to stop. Mr. Roy Lance, uh, I can hear you pretty well. If you have a chance to maybe speak up just a little bit, uh, that would probably be helpful. But uh, I may be the only one who uh, you sound a little think to. Okay, I'll try to do a better job. Thanks for letting me know. All right, uh, first I'd like to give you a little bit of background about the MOU committee meeting, just as a refresher or for anybody else, you know, anybody in the audience that, that might not be familiar with the work. Um, the, the town and Garner Fire have, over the years, had numerous different conversations about the possibility of merging or unifying the most recent incarnation uh, of which started in uh, late 2017 <laughs> at a joint meeting with the town council and the fire board. And both groups agreed that they would appoint some members to discuss this further, and that's what we informally have come to call the MOU committee. At the time, there were five members on that committee, um, Mr. Marshburn and Mr. Kennedy, who were both town council members at that time, and then from the fire board, Nancy Anderson, Kenny Walker, and Carl Williams. And then, of course, there were staff from both, um, both organizations that participated as well. Uh, we first met in uh, January 2018, so it's been almost three years now. And we've, we've put a lot of work in. And some things have changed. Uh, you know, we've, with the elections, we had some changes on the town council. And so in 2020, last year, we, um, we added council members Vance and Matthews to the um, to the MOU committee meeting since uh, Mr. Marshburn's role changed as the mayor and Mr. Kennedy is no longer on council. So therefore, you know, since neither of those members are, are voting council members in recent typical situations, we thought it would make sense to have some additional representation. So um, that's a little bit of background about how we got started. And we have uh, spent a number of meetings getting together and talking about things like the history and tradition in the, the Garner Fire Rescue Department, the accreditation process that they're going through, which is uh, really hitting a, a peak right now as they get close to the, the, the end of that process, uh, what some merger processes have looked like in other jurisdictions. Uh, you know, Wake Forest is a recent example that's, that's come to mind locally, but there certainly have been others that we have looked at and talked about, including Pupoy Marina. We've also toured some facilities uh, with the, the Garner, uh, you know, all the fire stations, the admin building, and so on. We spent a number of meetings talking about pay and benefit practices, you know, how, how theirs and ours compare, as well as you know, IT setup, finance and budgeting practices, and so on. And, and lastly, we've had some conversations with Wake County as well, since they're a key funding partner, since Garner Fire serves an area that goes much beyond just the town limits. So that uh, the committee has done a lot of work up to this point, a uh, considerable amount of effort. And so you might be wondering why, uh, why a consultant, but 
I think there are some several key tasks that we would really benefit from bringing out a third party expert in to help us with. Um, and Chief Grayson uh, with North Carolina Fire Chief Consultants is very well qualified. He's, uh, he's been a fire chief in Burlington, Asheville, and Greensboro, and has a, a wealth of other experience and a, a team of similarly qualified people that can help us. So there really are um, a few key areas, and, and we'll get to the scope of work on the next slide, but uh, you know, a few key areas where we think a consultant can really add a significant amount of value over what staff would be able to do by ourselves. Uh, the first is, you know, sometimes stakeholder feedback just works better when you have a neutral third party involved. And, you know, we, we think this is the case here that, you know, if we have, um, you know, if, if Chief Poole were to ask his, uh, his firefighters their opinion about the, the merger or issues that, that they think need to be addressed, um, I probably would get good feedback, but there there might be some people that you know weren't 100% comfortable sharing that feedback in, in that way. And the same way might be true for um, for the town staff or town representative. Um, and so sometimes there's just benefit to having a a, a neutral party that can uh, help people feel comfortable sharing their thoughts. And there's a lot of different groups that we need to get feedback from the you know. Council members, MOU committee members, fire board members, staff from both the town and um, and fire. So there's um there's a lot of different groups and a lot of different combinations, and we think there'd be benefit in having that neutral third party helping with that. And uh, the other thing is, you know, this is uh the, this merger or unification process is, you know, it's not something that the town has ever done before. You know, most most towns and most fire departments do it probably once if if ever, and so. While we have put a lot of time and effort into thinking about all the all the nuances and the and the pieces that need to go into it, there's always things that come along with experience. You know, you live and learn, and you realize after doing something a few times how to do it better, and some little things that maybe you missed the first time. And we think, by virtue of of hiring a consultant who's done this before, that there'll be a lower chance that that we miss some of those things. And that'll be particularly true, I think, when it comes to the financial analysis. You know, maybe accidentally, you know, we, we might on our own have, have missed a, a few details that might have changed the, the cost of doing this merger and lots of other implementation details that, you know, we think anybody who's gone through this before, there's just a, you know, an inherent, you know, better understanding that comes with experience. So, um, with that, just wanted to cover real briefly what's in the proposed scope of work. Uh, the, the stakeholder feedback, as you heard me mention, um, again, that all the different internal, what I'm calling the internal parties, and then uh, also an opportunity to hear from residents, both within the town of Garner and outside the town limits, but in the service area for Garner Fire Rescue. So, you know, we, we think it's appropriate along the way to get feedback from the users of this uh, the service, and uh, the also you know getting a, a firmer understanding of what the costs will be, so we can plan accordingly for those, and developing an implementation plan. You know all the steps that we need to take if the decision is to move forward, and, and we have everything in line to to do that, uh, and then to provide some assistance with just facilitating and you know keeping things moving uh, when we go through that process. So let me uh, close by just um, telling you a little bit about what it would cost and how we would pay for it. Um, first off, you know, we do have the option to stop after each phase of that work if we feel like, you know, we need to, you know, pause or reconsider or if there's anything that comes up that would um, that would change the direction that we're going. So we, we do have that option in the contract. Also, the contract is based on uh, a fixed hourly rate and then a number of hours that we estimate will be required to do this work. And that could vary somewhat, you know, up or down, but we think it will be pretty close to $50,000 as well as some reimbursable expenses. Um, you know, if, if possible, some of these stakeholder meetings will be done in person, but, you know, given the current environment with COVID that, um, you know, that may or may not be practical and we'll just have to see what the situation allows when the time comes. So exactly how much mileage and other sort of reimbursable expenses will have to be determined, but gives you a general idea of what the cost would be. And uh, in terms of how we would pay for it, you've heard Mike Franks, uh, the budget officer, 
tell you that you know we have budgeted very conservatively for sales tax revenue because we weren't sure with COVID whether we were going to see the kind of growth that we have seen in recent years. And um, you know, as it turns out, that that growth has been much higher than budgeted, much higher than expected for that matter. And there is a significant amount of extra sales tax revenue. And so uh, we're proposing to bring forward a budget amendment at a future meeting that would recognize an increase in sales tax revenue and then an increase in expenditures to offset that to help pay for this contract. And it, it might be for an amount slightly higher than the 49,000 just to give us a, a little bit of wiggle room with the expenses and that kind of thing. But <clears throat> in any event, you would see that at a future meeting. So um, with that, I will pause and stop sharing my screen so that you can ask questions of um, me or anybody else who's on the call. I should uh, mention, uh, Mr. Roy Lance, that um, I'm, I'm not sure what his official title is. He's been the uh, he's been the chairman of the group, the facilitator of the group, or all those things that uh, calls meetings and uh, makes out the agendas and uh, makes the able presentations like he's done this evening. So uh, there's a debt of gratitude uh, to him for uh, helping us get to this point. Uh, he's done a lot of the. Uh, background work and, and, and work that is not often seen, but uh, I wanted to thank him for for his leadership uh, on this committee. And of course, the town manager has also uh, been involved to uh, to some extent as well. So uh, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Roy Land. So at this time, um, council, uh, you've heard the presentation and the request as it relates to the hiring of the consultant. So uh, I'll um, give you a chance uh, to comment and or ask questions. When we start with uh, with Miss Beringer this time. Okay. The only question I have is, um, did we anticipate from the beginning that we would need a consultant, or is that something that we have learned as we've gone along? I would say that. Um, I think we considered it, that we might want to from the very beginning, but we didn't want to do that immediately because we wanted to get into it ourselves and see, you know, see how things were going and see what we felt we needed. And so I, I think the, the scope of work that you see before you tonight represents the specific tasks that we think we could really use some extra help with. And a lot of the other tasks that, that might have been in there if we had um, gotten a consultant from the very beginning, we've been able to do ourselves. So I. I think it was um, it was always a possibility, but we just didn't know for sure until we got further along. Okay, thank you. And I would just echo what Mr. Roy Lance has said as the um, one of the uh, initial selected representatives from the council meeting, Mr. Kennedy. By the way, with Mr. Kennedy's background, uh, he is still on the committee, but obviously he was no longer a, an elected official uh, a voting member. So um, I think when we started, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of background information that we covered and a lot of discussions. Uh, I think initially we may have thought that we might be able to do this, uh, but I think the further we got into the matter, uh, the more it seemed um, probable that a consultant could uh, could uh, help us uh, get across what I call the finish line and, and help us with some of these things that Matt has mentioned here. So um, I agree with what he said. Um, Mr. Singleton, I recognize you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, I know we the consultant was mentioned early on, and so I think it's, uh, it's the committee's recommendation that we accept it and uh, move forward with this and uh, continue to move toward this uh, this merger. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Dellinger. Yeah, I think it's definitely something we need to move forward on now so we can start to make some decisions. I guess the, one of the things I want to be clear on sort of the outcomes of this is I see that there's the development of an implementation plan. Um, I also want to make sure that there's a not, there's that scenario of merging and there's another scenario of not merging so that both entities can weigh the costs and benefits of both scenarios. And I guess my other question is, and I'm not familiar with how these mergers happen, as I guess but a lot of people aren't. Um, are there diff if there are different models that are used or if there's a single model that is used for this type of merger, um, that may be a yes or no question. Um, and I don't know if it's something that de is dependent on, you know, the relationship that both entities want. So is there really like one merger scenario 
or are there a couple of options even within the merger scenario, generally speaking? Um, well, let me, let me tackle the first part of that, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to um, Chief Grayson to talk about some different merger scenarios that he may have seen as far as how those can be handled. Um, yeah, there, there are different, as I mentioned, uh, different, after different phases of the work, there's a sort of a check-in opportunity. And so, you know, if after hearing feedback from the, the public or the, you know, the staff, that was, you know, something that council or the MOU committee meeting, uh, sorry, committee members wanted to, uh, you know, pause and consider further, they could do that. If after the financial analysis, we need to pause and consider further, there'll be those built-in opportunities. So, yeah, I think, I think we can look at, you know, lot merging and not merging there, you know, we're, we still have the opportunity to think that we've, we've put a lot of effort into the direction of merging because we think there's potential there, but it's, that's, that's the reason that we're doing this work is, is to be sure before we get into something that is not beneficial. So, um, Chief Grayson, could you talk a little bit about your experience with other merger scenarios? Yes, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and council members. Uh, usually the situation is either really a yes or a no. Uh, I think it's either you, you're ready to do it or you're not. Uh, your contract or agreement has to be something that's agreeable to both parties. So there might not be a, the, the terms may not be ready or the timing may not be right. But at the end of the day, it really has to be we're ready to do this or we're not. And I, so that would be my uh, my recommendation to you is, um, you know, you may have uh, conditions or terms that need a little more time. You may need uh, to work some some pieces of that out. But um, to to hybrid that or stair step into it, most uh, groups find that you're better to either be ready to go or not ready to go. Thank you. Okay, That's all. Mr. Thank Young. you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. And by the way, uh, most of you probably know that uh, Chief Poole is still uh, with us. And so uh, after we've uh, polled the council here, we'll uh, also uh, give an opportunity for him to uh, to make some comments. So at this time, I'll uh, I'll recognize uh, Mr. Vance. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor Council, I will recommend moving forward with the, uh, with the scope of work for the consulting services related to the fire merger, and um, I am, I mean, I'm supportive of the supportive of this endeavor. I've been working with uh, the committee for a while, and recommend that we move forward in uh, with, with due diligence. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as serving on this board, I think we've come a long way. I've been pleased with the input we are getting from. Uh, both the town side as well as the fire department under Chief Poole's leadership. And uh, I think we've, uh, some of the things that have popped up, we've dealt with, and I think to everybody's satisfaction, and we're really bringing this thing probably closer than it's ever been. And having Greg come on board with his background and working with some other communities, as well as one of the things that we want to do was get input from the rank and file firemen sometimes People are hesitant, uh, career employees are hesitant about talking, being a fireman. I know how that deal works. Uh, Greg, you're not going down that same road. But uh, they're hesitant to talk, but we need that input because it is very important. I think bringing Greg on board and some of the recommendations we came back along with Chief Poole and Matt and, and the team, that we'll get some of that feedback. Uh, I feel really good about this. I think we're going to get there. I really do. You know, I've seen this We've been working on for years, and we're right now at that pivotal point. And bringing Greg on, I think it's going to be uh, that uh, it's going to kind of set the bar as to we're going to jump over it. And I think we really all want to, and we'll we'll uh, lean into his expertise and what's happened to other communities as they have made this decision. And in the town of Garner, uh, with the growth we've got going on now, we we are making a lot of changes, and this is time to make this and bring it all under one umbrella. And I think we'll all be the better for it. And uh, so uh, I agree with my, my colleagues that uh, I think we need to bring Greg on in and uh, let's push this thing to the next level and, uh, and, and make it all happen. So you, you have my full support on this, Matt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one, one thing I might observe, uh, and I don't know that Mr. Grayson would say this is unusual, but 
uh, maybe it was a little unique as we started this. Obviously, the fire department had already started an accreditation process. And so uh, from the outset, uh, they requested uh, that, um, you know, the committee and its work uh, uh, allow them to continue with the accreditation process as something they were sold on and wanted to do. And so I think we committed early on to say, yes, we, we want you to follow through with that. And so... Uh, I don't know that that's really slowed us down that much, but we wanted to be sensitive to uh, uh, the time that they needed to to work through that process as well. So uh, just wanted to make that note. Uh, Chief Poole, um, you certainly have been uh, involved from the outset. So uh, are there any uh, observations uh, you would like to make at this time? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll just reiterate what Mr. Royland said, that um, you know, we've done a a lot of work in the last few years working on this merger and we got to a point where we believe a third party would be beneficial um, it, it, from, from my opinion if, if we are truly concerned with how our staff and how your firefighters feel about this we want them to be open and honest about it and we believe that a third party um, coming in and, and doing some stakeholder and feedback sessions we would get it more relative information. So I appreciate that opportunity. I also uh, agree that, that Chief Grayson's consulting firm uh, was the right choice. They have um, local knowledge. They they were involved in the Lake Forest merger um, a year or two ago. And so they've got some relative experience in size and scope of our process. So um, I don't have any, any questions regarding the study. I would just affirm Mr. Mayor in case any of our if our board members are on, they may want an opportunity to come in as well. I'm not I'm not sure if anybody is on, but outside of that, I look forward to working with Chief Grayson and Mr. Royland. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Chief Poole, um, thank you very much. I, I believe um, I've noticed uh, maybe uh, one of the uh, uh, members, Nancy Anderson, I believe, are you with us? I am. Okay. We'll give you an opportunity for uh, any uh, brief comments at this time. I, I think I would just reiterate what you had said before about the great work that Matt Roylance has done in helping us in this process and that he and Chief Poole have worked very hard to make sure that points of view are represented and that um, we're moving ahead in a positive way. And I think the consultant at this point is a positive act for us to take. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm not aware if there are any other of the uh, fire board members. I don't uh, think I see any from my screen, but that doesn't mean there might be any others. Uh, Matt, are you aware of anybody else, Matt Poole? Uh, no, sir. Okay. All right. Um, well, a good presentation, good uh, questions and answers, and um, I believe the issue before the council at this time, unless you need additional information, uh, is to... Uh, consider approving the uh, the consultant contract that's been presented to you this evening uh, so that uh, that will uh, be the next step we'll take. So if there are no other questions or comments, I would entertain a motion to that effect. Mr. Mayor, so we approve the attached contract scope for the consulting services related to the fire merger. Okay, sure. uh, Okay, motion made by uh, Councilmember Singleton and seconded by Councilmember Behringer. Any other question or comment quickly before we vote? Okay, hearing none, I will ask our town clerk to call the roll. Please vote aye if you favor this, and obviously no if you do not. Councilmember Matthews? Aye. Councilmember Singleton? Aye. Councilmember Vance? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Behringer? Aye. And Councilmember Dellinger. Aye. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gibson, and thank you, Council, uh, for uh, for your uh, action on this to vote. Uh, this will allow the committee, I think, to uh, to move right along and you know, without hesitation. And uh, uh, Matt, I believe the understanding is that uh, consultant will uh, will jump right into this uh, forthwith. Is that right? That is right. Thank you okay. Very much. Okay, any closing comments you want to make? No, just that I uh, appreciate your support and, uh, and, and your kind words, and we'll look forward to moving on to this next phase of the work. Okay, thank you, sir, very much. Okay. All right, thanks, Council. Um, 
I'm going to move right into the uh, next item for presentation. And um, this is item two, um, amendment to chapter three, uh, animals and fowl. Most of you will remember that Chief Benz uh, brought uh, this item before us uh, several months ago, and there were some questions and uh, that were asked, and he was asked to take this back and, and uh, I think to tweak it a little bit. And it appears to me that he has certainly done that. Uh, I've looked at the suggested changes. So, uh, Chief Benz, if uh, if you're with us online, I assume you are, I'm going to uh, uh, give the floor to you, sir, for your presentation. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, thank you very much. I want to try to share my screen just to bring that uh, Chapter 3 amendment up. And please let me know if it is there for you to see. Do you see that? We do have that, yeah. Okay. So again, this was brought to you several months ago. There was there's been several situations over the last, I guess, year or so that necessitated some changes to to the uh, ordinance. Uh, some of it dealing specifically with uh, as we go through it, securing closures and, and what does that exactly mean. Uh, some of it dealing specifically with uh, animals at large uh, and nuisance animals. Uh, so I'll talk through those as we walk through the the different changes that are recommended. Um, the first change uh, is the definition of the bite. Uh, Right, it means the act of an animal seizing flesh with its teeth or jaws so as to tear or pierce the flesh. We removed injure um, because our working definition of, a, of an animal bite is actually piercing the skin with the teeth and it really doesn't count uh, unless it does that. So there, obviously there's other pieces of the ordinance that handle uh, the attack itself and those, those things, but the actual bite to be an animal bite that necessitates the uh, follow up from the medical care, uh, it actually has to pierce this flesh. Uh, the second piece is a securing closure right here. Um, what we found is that we've had situations arise where we've had uh, dangerous animals or we tried to have a, uh, a resident uh, secure their animal, uh, but they live in an apartment or they live in a townhome where they don't have any physical land and actually to build a, 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 uh, a structure to secure their animal. So we've, we've modified that definition uh, to mean also inside a residence, home or apartment if the animal is kept as an inside pet. And then for an outdoor pet, a secure enclosure means an enclosure uh, with a minimum size of 15 feet. Again, that, that is nothing changed. So we've, we've left that the same. Um, it's going to be at eight by eight with a floor consisting of a concrete pad, at least four inches thick. The walls, the roof of the structure must be construed of welded chain link fencing with a minimum thickness of 12 gauge. Supporting poles, at least two, one half, two and a half inches in diameter. The vertical poles must be sunk in concrete filled holes at least 18 inches deep and at least eight inches in diameter. The chain link fencing must be anchored to a concrete pad with galvanized steel anchors placed at intervals no more than 12 inches long at the perimeter of the concrete pad. So, again, that piece of it did not change. The only thing that did change specifically was allowing uh, a secure enclosure to also the inside of a residence or an apartment complex if that was the definition. Attended tethering is also a piece that we decided to look at. Uh, attended tethering shall be permitted if the owner or other responsible person is present on the premises instead of just outside on the premises with the dog. Tethering of a dog shall be on a device of at least 10 feet long with a harness, collar, or other device uh, compensated with the size of a dog and shall not exceed three hours of continuous duration in a 24 hour period. And, and really the reason for this behind this change was that we've had uh, residents who want to tether their dog on their deck for an hour or so. It's nice outside and they don't have to stay outside with it. They could be inside on the, on their, on their in their kitchen or uh, in their living room. So they, have, they don't necessarily have a neighbor calling and saying, hey, they're tethering and they're violating your ordinance. So this gives them an option to allow that to happen at a short amount of time. Um, Obviously, we depend on people to uh, to uh, to monitor themselves and make sure they're following and doing the right thing. But again, this allows some flexibility for residents. Uh, section four, prohibited actions. We removed animals at large in its entirety and, and combined animals at large with prohibited actions. So prohibited actions now encompasses animals at large, nuisance animals, and all those different things that, that, that require uh, us to get involved when the animal is bothering somebody else's property or on somebody else's property, whether uh, they're using the bathroom on that property or whatever. So I'll just walk through that real quick. Um, it is unlawful for any person to own, keep, possess, or maintain an animal in such a manner or to permit an animal to run at large. So it's still in there. The animal control officer shall confiscate any animal found at large and impound such animal at the animal shelter in accordance with the revisions of this article. 
Exceptions. An owner may lawfully permit an animal which is not dangerous to be at large in the course of a show, obedience school, tracking test, field training, or they're supervised by a recognized organization. That that does not change from our, our original ordinance. It should be unlawful for a person to possess or maintain an animal that engages in the following con conducts that creates the nuisance. So these are the prohibited actions. Uh, animals that habitually, repeatedly disturb, interfere, annoy human beings or other animals uh, while not in the mode of attack. Animals that tip over garbage containers or damage gardens, flowers, or vegetables. In the case of a female animal, one that is not confined in a secure enclosure during estrus. Allowing any dog... Uh, to leave its feces on public streets, sidewalks, towns, or other town property or other property of another without the permission of the owner of the property. Maintaining an animal that barks, whines, howls, or yells in ex uh, excessive or continuous untimely fashion or makes other noises in such a manner that results in annoyance or interference with the reasonable use and enjoyment of neighboring premises. Maintaining an animal that damages or interferes with private property. Maintaining an animal that chases, snaps at, attacks, or otherwise molests pedestrians, bicyclists, motor vehicle passengers, or farm stock, or domestic animals. And maintaining an animal that is deceased or date, or sorry, diseased or dangerous to the health of the, or the, of the public or other domestic animals unless under the care of a licensed veterinarian. Maintaining any rooster that loudly habitually crows or maintaining an animal that is at large or loiters in public places or on the property of another. Um, when the animal control officer's investigation determined that three reports of action prohibited by this section have occurred with a 90-day period, a nuisance animal notice will be issued, which requires the owner or person in possession of the animal to keep the animal on his or her own property at all times unless the animal is under restraint or to take specific actions to limit excessive barks, whines, howls, yowls, or other disturbing behavior. Penalties for such subsequent violations begin after the nuisance animal notice has been issued, which is the fourth offense in a 90-day 90 90-day period. And just some background on the reason of this change is we've had situations where we've where we've had to warn residents, uh, for example, last summer that their dog was at large, and then their dog got out twice at some point during the summer, and they finally were able to figure out a way to keep the dog in. And then six or eight months later, they get out again. Well, by our old ordinance, we were required, basically, they were violating the ordinance. So it was a, it was a civil citation. And again, we're trying to make sure that people do the right thing and are trying to, uh, to abide by the ordinance. We're not trying to punish people. We're trying to make sure that we abide by the ordinance. Um, it gives, still gives us the opportunity to charge uh, once, once it does become a, a nuisance violation. Section 517, uh, 317, Control of Dangerous Animals. We rewrote this to to be more conclusive or inclusive of, of many of the different uh, areas that we, we had trouble with. So it's been, it is, shall be unlawful for any owner of a dangerous animal to permit it to be at large. The animal control officer may declare any animal is dangerous who bites, attacks, or otherwise inflicts serious injury on a person with, without provocation or public or private property, kills or injures a pet or domestic animal without provocation, is owned, trained, or harbored primarily or, or in part for the purpose of, of dog fighting and or approaches a person not on the owner's property in a vicious or terrorizing manner in apparent attitude of attack. It is lawful for any owner to maintain or harbor unconfined or unrestrained any animals which has been deemed a dangerous animal by the animal control officer. And the animal control officer has that sole authority to, to deem an animal dangerous. The owner of that animal, which has been deemed dangerous, which has generally been maintained outdoors, shall have the 60 days from the date of notification to provide a humane, outdoor, secure enclosure, as we defined earlier. The owners shall post plainly visible signs upon the secure enclosure, warning that there is a dangerous animal on the premises. The sign shall be at least one foot by two feet and square or two square feet in area. Lettering on the sign shall be proportionate with the sign and must be approved by the animal control officer. The owner of a damaged animal, which is generally maintained indoors, including in a location such as an apartment where it is not feasible to construct an enclosure, shall confine the animal inside the residence. The owner's residence shall satisfy that secure enclosure requirement. The, the animal deemed to be dangerous shall be kept at the animal shelter at the owner's expense until the appropriate enclosure is available and the owner applies for it and receives the appropriate permit. When a dangerous animal is confiscated under this provision, the owner of any dangerous animal shall be given written notice at the time of confiscation that if the owner fails to obtain a permit upon the expiration of that 60 days for the confiscation, it will become the property of the town and be turned over to the animal shelter for disposition. If the, 
If the owner of a dangerous animal obtains a permit to return the animal to the owner's premises and including where required constructs a secure enclosure, which is approved by the ACO within the 60 days, the animal may be released from confiscation so long as all civil penalties, fees, and anything owing to the town of Garner Animal Control Program and animal shelter for harboring, carrying, and maintaining the animal are paid. If the owner of a dangerous animal obtains a permit to return the animal to the owner's premises and including where required constructs the secure enclosure and the animal is again confiscated, the animal will become the property of the town and will be returned over to the animal shelter for disposition. So if it's, if it's found once it's dangerous and it gets off its leash again, then it will be turned over to the shelter. The owner of a dangerous animal shall keep the animal leashed, muzzled, and under the control of an adult owner or other responsible adult at all times when the animal is not inside the owner's residence or in the secure enclosure described above. The owner of a dangerous animal shall permanently identify the animal as a dangerous animal by a microchip implanted under the animal's skin within 60 days from the date of notification to do so at the owner's expense. The owner of a dangerous animal will be notified in writing regarding whether the generally maintained indoors or generally maintained outdoors subsections apply to that animal. And the animal control officer will be the one that makes that decision. The owner of a dangerous animal shall allow the animal control officer to access and inspect the owner's premises as necessary to ensure compliance with state laws and local ordinances. Once the owner of a dangerous animal has met all the criteria for harboring dangerous animals and permitted We're losing your audio, uh, Captain the Chief Benz, I believe, or I am. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We 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 still are not able Proof. to hear you at this time. Can you hear me? That's better, yeah. Okay, I, it just must have faded out. Sorry. To obtain the permit described above, the owner shall be required to establish the following that all civil penalties due have been paid and that all fees due to the animal control program and the animal shelter have been paid and the permit fee of $500 has been paid and that the owner agrees that the animal shall be kept indoors or maintained on a leash muzzled and under the control of an adult owner or other responsible adult at all times or in the secure enclosure where required. That the owner has obtained owner's or renter's insurance with liability coverage for the dog attacks and provide the town with a certificate of issuance of insurance, the permit shall become effective. So chat Chief, section uh, six. Chief, let me rudely interrupt you. Um, uh, you're on a roll, so maybe fine. I shouldn't, but uh, by the same token, maybe you ought to catch your breath <laughs> a little bit. I, I just wanted to maybe pause for just a brief moment. You've covered a lot of territory there. Uh, and maybe uh, before you get into the rest of this, uh, just do a quick round robin to see if any council members, uh, anything particular uh, they want to comment on at this point, and then we'll let you continue. So I'll just ask the general question uh, if uh, anything the chief has covered so far uh, raises a question in the mind of any council member, now will be a time to ask it. No, but I'll say thank you for continuing to update uh, this information in regards to nuisance animals due to uh, previous due to experiences in the last couple of two or three years that have uh, caused uh, this to uh, modification and tweaking and updating uh, these rules, these laws, excuse me. Okay. All right. I agree with Gray that uh, especially with the new type of de developments coming into Garner, more condominiums and people living in closer proximity and uh, those that, you know, wish to have dogs, that's their business, but, you know, there are those that don't have the animals and they got their uh, concerns also. It sounds like you're kind of, you're, you're getting down to the to the meat of it now, which is very important. And uh, so if they know up front firsthand before they go bring a pet in, here are the rules that you got to abide by. I think you guys are, I hate to use the term, putting some teeth in it, being talking about dogs here, but uh, you, you're really getting to the point. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll chime in since it's almost done. I'll just go ahead and say, um, thanks for bringing this back. It's extremely thorough. Um, also I'm very appreciative of the, the format. It was presented to us with the changes and then the context of the full, um, part of the ordinance with the highlighted new parts makes it very easy to understand what the changes are and how they fit with the rest of the code. So thank you for that too. I'll give uh, Terry kudos. She helped me put the, uh, the the brief piece together. I took care of the rest of it. But yes, she's uh, she's awesome. 
Okay. Well, yeah, he's almost finished anyway, and so, Council, you'll have a, another opportunity at the end, but I wanted to give you a quick um, opportunity now. So, uh, Chief, if you'll go ahead with the remainder, you're, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you further at the end. Sure. There's only really a really brief part about this left. Um, Section 325, imposition of penalties is where we're at now. Any person who violates subsection 35C regarding the noxious odor shall be provided written notice of the violation and an explanation of how to come into compliance with the ordinance violated. If the violation is not corrected within 15 days, the owner shall be assessed a civil penalty of $100 each day after the 15-day period counts as a new violation. Uh, any person who violates 35 to or 313 regarding the number of animals allowed shall be provided written notice of violation and explanation on how to come into compliance with the ordinance violated. If the violation is not corrected within 15 days, the owner shall be assessed a civil penalty of $100 for each animal over the limit. Uh, uh, and this is really where it gets down to the violations of the the, the uh, nuisance and uh, uh Illegal acts by the by the animals. Violation of Section 315 prohibited actions occurs the following civil penalties. First violation is a fifty dollar fine. This is number, violation number four. Uh, so you get three warnings, and then the fourth. Second violation after a nuisance violation issued is a hundred dollars, and then is, every succeeding violation is a hundred and fifty dollars. Um, under Section Seven, where we talked about appeals, really the only change here is that we went from a a assistant town manager to more than one assistant town manager, so we had to change that up. So at least one assistant town manager right here and two other employees of the department makes up the the appeals process, or or in the town to hear the appeals of, of actions taken pursuant to this chapter. Uh, the appeals board shall render a decision within three business days of the hearing, and the decision of the appeals board is subject to appeal to the superior court. So those are the changes specifically, again, the violations, uh, as well as uh, as far as who's going to hear the appeals. Again, we went from one assistant town manager to two assistant town managers. Okay, so you've heard the uh, the final um, uh, portion of this. And, and I might just comment that uh, um, uh, I, I believe it's fair to say that just about all of our animal owners in our town uh, certainly seek to comply uh, with the town ordinance and want to do all they can to uh, maintain their pets safely and, uh, and, and not in a way that would disturb uh, neighbors and others. Uh, but from time to time, uh, issues do occur. And so uh, I'm aware of uh, some of those. And so this was an attempt to clarify any areas where there's uh, maybe some questionable language or, or some interpretation. And so with the help of our town attorney, uh, he's gone through in a thorough way and I think addressed most of the issues I'm aware of. So um, I commend you for doing that. But uh, council, now that you've heard the entire uh, report, give you another opportunity to comment. And of course, uh, this is being brought to us to uh, consider going ahead and adopting these changes uh, to chapter three um, under the ordinance he's covered. So. Uh, if before you vote, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, uh, we'll do a quick round robin. I'll start with Mr. Dellinger. Uh, same comments as before. Um, good rewrite from based on the previous feedback and uh, the presentation in our notes for the meeting are well organized too. It's very helpful to see how that all fits together. So thank you and, thank you. and Terry. Okay, thank you. Mr. Vance? Uh, same comments, good job, Chief. Okay, Mr. Singleton. Yes, I agree, Chief. Thank you. We've come a long way since uh, December of 2001 in January, February, and March of 2002. Mr. Matthews remembers this when we had town oh, yeah. for four meetings packed with people about dog issues and um, another couple meetings, and that's when a lot of this stuff was, was put together uh, or, or substantially upgraded back at that time. So thank you again, Chief for uh, working on this. And I agree with Mr. what Mr. Dellinger just said. The presentation uh, showing the highlights and the complete text makes it very easy to see what changes were, were made. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Beringer. I will just echo what my fellow council members have said. This is a, a really great presentation, easy to understand and uh, needed to be done and appreciate all the hard work. And aren't we glad we brought Terry on board to help out? Okay, and Mr. Matthews. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, appreciate Mr. Singleton. That was an interesting night we had back in those days. And I think that pioneered where we're at today. Great job, Chief, of what you've done here. I just have one question. On the uh, civil penalties to 50, 100, 150, uh, how did y'all uh, come up with that figure? Just out of curiosity, is, is what everybody else, municipalities are doing, or is that strong that's, enough? Yeah, that's yes, sir. That's generally what other municipalities are doing, and that way it, we figured it would double uh, at least the first time, and then $50 each additional time so that uh, until they make, until they fix the issue. Okay, good job. Okay, thank you all, Council Members. So, um, so Chief, um, am I correctly stating that uh, you're bringing this proposal to us with the proposed changes, Chapter Three, and asking the uh, asking the uh, Council to approve uh, uh, approve these uh, changes, right? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So, Council Members, unless you have other questions at this time or other comments, uh, I'll entertain a motion uh, that uh, these. Uh, Proposed changes to Chapter Three be adopted. Mr. Mayor, I move that we uh, adopt proposed changes to Chapter Three, Animals and Fowl, and approve Ordinance Two Zero Two One Five Zero One One. Okay, sir. Second. Okay, motion properly made by Mr. Vance and seconded by Mr. Matthews. Uh, just before we vote, any other comment or question? Hearing none, I will uh, ask the uh, clerk to uh, call the roll at this time. Councilmember Singleton? Aye. Councilmember Vance? Aye. Mayor Pro Tim Berenger? Aye. Councilmember Dellinger? Aye. And Councilmember Matthews? Aye. Okay, so the motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you again, Chief, for your work on this. I know it's been a work in progress for some time, so uh, thank you for your diligent work. You and the town thank attorney you. both. So thank you. unless you have other business before us, we'll excuse you for the night. You've had a long day, I suspect. Sure enough. Um, All right, thank you. Good night. Okay, thank good you. night, sir. Okay, uh, council members, uh, we'll move right into the uh, next item. And this is a follow up to a presentation we had, I believe, in our work session. So, uh, Mr. Johnson, Chris Johnson, our town engineer, is uh, prepared to uh, present this item to us a traffic calming policy. Mr. Johnson. Good evening, Mayor and council members. Uh, yes, this is an item that is carried over. I'm going to provide you a similar uh maybe slightly condensed version of the presentation we we provided you at the recent work session um please let me know if that's coming through to you yes yep it's on the screen so the traffic calling policy this kind of brings us to the end of a, about a year of, of since council directed us to take a look at this policy and um uh, There's an agenda for us, uh, really just kind of go over the, the traffic calming program and the purpose of traffic calming. Um, we'll talk about the policy schedule and the work we've completed to date, and then uh, do an overview of the types of traffic calming, uh, summary of the new changes uh, within the policy that we have brought to council, and then the final recommendations. So general purpose of traffic calming, of course, this applies to residential neighborhoods. Uh, and we're, 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 most of these requests that we have come to us uh, because we've got an applicant that lives in the neighborhood or perhaps an HOA on behalf of the neighborhood is looking to uh, reduce speeds uh, within the neighborhood, uh, which can be a lot of the time due to uh, cut through traffic or, or other vehicle users from outside the neighborhood. Uh, but the purpose of traffic calming is to try to promote complete street concepts and not just make the streets uh, solely for the use of motorists, but also to make sure that we're accommodating pedestrians, cyclists, uh, transit, and the residents that live within these neighborhoods. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are looking to reduce speeding uh, along the streets. Uh, and sometimes, as I said, this is due to uh, cut through traffic. Uh, so they're maybe also looking to decrease traffic volumes and allow some of those cut-throughs to utilize other uh, routes around the neighborhood. 
Uh, we also want to make sure that we're still maintaining appropriate emergency vehicle access for the fire and uh, emergency response teams. And we do try to do our best, although sometimes uh, speed humps may not be the most uh, good looking thing in the world. Uh, we do try to do work and, and do other applications where appropriate uh, to create attractive streets. Um, and then overall, this is to increase the quality of life for the neighborhood, uh, allow other people to utilize the street and get people outdoors. So as far as our work to date, uh, this started about a year ago. Council directed staff to take a look at the traffic calming policy, which was last revised back in 2009. Uh, staff, uh, during the spring of last year, analyzed the current policy, and we actually reached out to several peer municipalities in the both Wake County and uh, other areas of the state uh, to compare our policy to see whether there were other uh, other techniques other municipalities were using or how their policies differed compared to the town of Garners. Um, after taking taking a look and, and completing that peer comparison, uh, we drafted a, uh, a, a draft policy concept uh, and presented that to the Public Works Committee. And that was in July. And following their approval of that concept, uh, staff began preparation of a new draft uh, traffic calming policy update. And we brought that uh, back to uh, Public Works Committee in December, uh, early December of, of last year. And that was uh, approved with by Public Works Committee with a few comments uh, to take into account. Uh, following that, we uh, made uh, some changes incorporated into the policy, and that was the version of the policy that was presented uh, at the work session just last week. And so that brings us to today uh, for a final presentation to uh, council uh, to consider adoption of the final policy. So uh, again, some of this will be uh, covered similar to our past presentation, but for those that may have missed this and those looking from home, uh, different types of uh, traffic calming. We've got low cost measures that we consider passive measures. These are things that can typically be done uh, at low cost and also sometimes with in-house resources. This could uh, include police enforcement. Uh, I know Town of Garner has, uh, has a radar sign similar to the picture you've got in the lower left corner uh, of this slide that we utilize to try to get people to be aware of the speeds that they're traveling and to, to be more mindful uh, within these areas. Uh, we also can, can look at doing paint striping, whether that be adding uh, new lane lines on a street that has no markings to, to provide a little bit narrower lane widths. Uh, it can also include adding crosswalks or parking bays uh, or sometimes bike lanes. We, we did a similar effort with bike lanes on Lakeside Drive last year. Uh, a lot of these, the, the main intent is to narrow the width of the travel lanes, which has a uh, secondary effect of uh, tending to slow drivers down. Uh, the, the narrower the lane, uh, the, the, the less comfortable a driver usually is. Um, then you move into what we consider tier two phys uh, physical measures. Uh, a lot of these are typically going to be your, uh, your, your, your standard speed tables that the, the picture on the left are some of the, the older methods that we used in the town of Garner uh, years ago. Uh, we're looking to modernize uh, those over time. And a picture on the right side here is, is sort of what most municipalities are using for speed tables today. Uh, this, this type uh, has, has less maintenance uh, issues, uh, and it also uh, is less likely for people to try to bypass uh, the smaller speed uh, humps that you see in the left side. There's also uh, including the, the, the raised crosswalks. This is basically a speed table with a crosswalk, so it can. Uh, there's not much difference between that and the asphalt speed table that I showed you on the last slide. Uh, and then also sometimes you can see, this is a picture over at NC State, where you can just add a very small pedestrian refuge. Uh, again, this, this has the effect of narrowing uh, the lane lines, and if it's a small area uh, such as this one, uh, we can usually do those at fairly low cost. Then once uh, you get into more your residential collector streets uh, where there's higher volumes and higher road widths, uh, speed tables become a little less uh, uh, helpful 
and or in some in some many cases they're they're not really preferred by for emergency access and that's when you need to go uh, look at higher cost uh, measures uh, that provide usually horizontal deflection uh, or again narrowing of lane widths uh, you can utilize uh, longer larger vegetated medians such as the ones we've got at these two locations uh, these those were in the city of Raleigh um, one on Glasscock Street. This is a, a, a example of what was called a bulb out. Some people call them neck downs or chokers. It's where you you bring the the the, the curb line inwards towards the center of the road uh, to narrow the lane width, especially at intersections, um, and it causes people to slow down as they enter the intersection. Uh, chicanes is more of a mid block uh, type application uh, that that actually requires you to uh, diverge uh, off the center of the lane. Uh, in many cases, these are, are done as a yield condition where one direction of traffic must stop and yield to the opposing uh, direction. And again, slowing traffic by horizontal deflection. And then uh, raised intersections. Uh, this was also one that was done a few years ago in the city of Raleigh. Um, this one, of course, was, was sort of what I would consider the Cadillac version. It, it included dyed concrete, for crosswalks, but you can also do them with standard uh, paint markings um, to provide the pedestrians uh, a level access to the street. And uh, it's more like an over uh, very large speed hump. Many traffic circles, uh, these are similar but different from what some may, may understand with roundabouts. Uh, traffic circles can be installed uh, Depending on the size of an intersection, they're, tended, they're intended to be installed in the center, but not touching the uh, corners of the intersection. So you need an intersection that is large enough to accommodate uh, traffic going around the circle uh, to all legs of the intersection. And these can come in both uh, mountable uh, hardscape versions like the picture on the right side. Uh, and in some cases, if they're large enough and you can maintain emergency access, you can actually look at uh, utilizing uh, vegetated uh, centers within the, the, the circles. Uh, so a lot of that depends on a case by case basis, uh, depending on the location. And then uh, some more le less common uh, types of traffic calming that you can use, uh, but they, they have a harder restriction on traffic is uh, diagonal and uh, diverters and half closures and full closures. So this is basically where you've, you've got a situation where you can actually uh, have enough connectivity within the neighborhood and the routes associated with the uh, region to actually cut off motor vehicular traffic from certain uh, streets. Uh, so when you do this, there, are the, there is the chance that you can still accommodate pedestrian and bike traffic uh, but these are sort of uh, less common and only unique. They're, 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 they're best used in unique situations where you have that flexibility. And then uh, last but not least, there are lots of different uh, new techniques being used uh, out there. Uh, these are not typically what we would uh, recommend under the traffic calming policy, but just kind of goes like if you've got uh, volunteers and 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 a means to come up with an art type project. These are different ways that other uh, municipalities are going about trying to slow down traffic. So it's just, just an idea, but not what we would assume to be used under this program. So measures we typically do not recommend for traffic calming uh, is adding four-way stop signs and speed warning signs. In many cases, these can uh, cause more, more problems and, and create other safety aspects uh, because Stop signs, can, adding four-way stops in, in situations can uh, cause people to stop and go and speed in other areas. It can also cause uh, pollution to the air and noise pollution to the people that are living in that area, and uh, people can run the stop signs. Um, you do, typically, you do not want to reduce the local street speed limits lower than 25 miles an hour, and in the case of uh, 35, if, if it's... If, Typically, if the 85th percentile speeds are, are traveling at a certain speed, changing the speed of the street alone is not going to change driver behavior. Um, rumble strips, uh, 
not something we would typically recommend because it does impact cyclists and pedestrians. And although roundabouts are a great uh, uh, measure that we are certainly supportive of on new projects, uh, especially on larger volume streets, uh, this is a very expensive solution for uh, local streets uh, because it does require quite a bit of impact uh, to the corners of in intersections uh, when you're trying to retrofit a roundabout into uh, an existing intersection. So uh, not the best for this program, but certainly roundabouts are a great traffic calming element elsewhere. So the summary of our new policy uh, and some of the differences and we've, we've got, uh, the traffic calming treatments we used were in line with our peers throughout the region. So we're not adding or taking away any of our current traffic calming treatments, but we are removing, we are recommending to move towards a tiered system, uh, similar to the tiers that I talked to, to you about in the earlier slides. Uh, the speed and volume uh, are our two main primary criteria. Uh, that is what is used in most uh, other municipalities as well. Our criteria was slightly higher than our peers, so the new policy uh, recommends a reduction uh, to the speed and volume criteria uh, so that it would be more in line with the other peer comparisons that we had in the study. Um, and then the petition process that we had was also in line with our peers uh, but we are looking to, we did make a recommendation to work to expedite uh, petitions for uh, the lower cost measures, tier one and tier two cases, uh, where we do have an HOA board that is approving the application and the staff's uh, de design recommendation. So just again, the, the tiered systems as we talked about, uh, tier one would be your lower cost uh, traffic calming devices that can be handled in-house and done in pretty pretty quick fashion, fashion uh, sometimes in, a, in conjunction with uh, one, either our annual resurfacing contract or as a change order somewhere else, um, or utilizing police enforcement or minor signage and marking installations that might be able to be done by public work staff. Then tier two is gonna be your mid cost. What I consider most of these to be is your vertical treatments. They're, they're only gonna be, uh, the, the, as per the policy would only be allowed on, on our narrower streets that are less than or equal to 35 foot edge of pavement to edge of pavement. Uh, these these, these um, <laughs> measure, measures typically do not require any impact outside the pavement area, so that allows them to be installed uh, without any kind of uh, right away or easements and minimal, minimal costs and impacts to adjacent owners. The tier three measures, uh, on the other hand, this is for our larger uh, wider streets that are over 35 mile, uh, 35 uh, feet edge of pavement to edge of pavement, where tier two measures are not preferable or allowed uh, due to emergency access reasons um, and traffic volumes. Uh, these would require typically a higher impact outside the pavement, uh, impacting possibly curb lines and drainage infrastructure, as well as adjoining properties within the areas of the devices being installed. For project funding, uh, we're recommending no changes. Uh, the, the traffic calming program is 100% town funded, and this matched up uh, to most of the peers in our study. Uh, the criteria, as I mentioned before, speed and volume, we are recommending a reduction to those thresholds. Uh, we're recommending the 85th percentile to be greater than or equal to eight miles per hour over the speed limit, which is a 20% reduction from the 10 miles per hour in the previous policy and the traffic volume requirement to be greater than or equal to 600 uh, vehicles per day for local streets and 900 vehicles per day for collector, residential collector streets. And that's a 25% reduction over the prior policy. The petition uh, side of things, uh, the threshold, we're recommending no changes. 67% of households must vote in support of the uh, traffic calming design recommendations. Uh, there was some comments at the work session, uh, I believe by Councilman Deliger, that uh, concerning how t uh, tenants would be involved in the process. Uh, with the help of the town attorney, we have added language and we've highlighted that in your backup packet uh, to, to try to make it very uh, clear that the town staff and town would, would like the landlords to communicate with their tenants throughout any petition processes that impact uh, their properties. 
uh, unfortunately, it's, it's hard to allow tenants to vote because the town staff has to uh, collect and verify all data associated with petitions, and we are not as privy to information regarding uh, leasing contracts between property owners and their tenants. Um, but that hopefully that, that language helps to bring them more into the process as a stakeholder. Uh, the petition requirement, uh, we are recommending that tier one devices, the lower cost measures, uh, do not require a petition. This is to help uh, allow uh, those types of either signage installations or um, small paint markings to be easily done uh, to help with areas uh, that may need that measure. Uh, tier two devices we've got set up uh, for those subdivisions that do not have an HOA, uh, a petition would be required, which is the same as the prior policy. Uh, however, we are wishing to add the recommendation for Tier 2 uh, for the petition to be waived if the uh, application is submitted by the HOA board uh, and they endorse the approved staff design, assuming the, the, the street meets eligibility requirements within the policy, uh, to waive that secondary petition requirement. And then for tier three measures, the higher cost, uh, we would require a petition for all subdivisions. Adoption effective date, uh, if this uh, new policy is approved tonight by council, then uh, it would be staff's plan to uh, make that policy effective immediately. And we uh, do have several uh, current traffic studies that were underway uh, that were submitted in 2020 that had been put on hold for a little while while we uh, were dealing with the pandemic and traffic volumes, uh, but we are wrapping up several uh, current studies that could be uh, taken into account with those new uh, policy criteria. And that concludes my res uh, presentation. I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Again, a good follow-up from the work session. Uh, I'll, I'll do a round robin with the uh, uh, council quickly to see if there are questions or comments uh, to be made at this time. I'll start with uh, Mr. Vance. Um, no questions at this time, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Mr. Singleton. No, sir. Thank you again for the work, uh, Chris, that y'all did on this. Okay. Uh, Ms. Berenger? No questions. Okay. Mr. Matthews? Uh, no questions. Good job on that, Chris. Okay. Mr. Dellinger? Uh, no questions. Just a comment that I still have a little bit of pause on the high threshold for the non-HOA neighborhoods, um, especially since some of those are becoming, getting more renters and landlords can be hard to get in touch with. And so I think it becomes a little bit harder for some of those neighborhoods to advocate for themselves and get the threshold for the petition. Um, but if that situation comes up, I'm sure that we'll find a way to uh, help them get some kind of help. So that's my only comment. Okay, thanks, sir. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Johnson, again, the request uh, after making this presentation is... Uh, to seek approval of the council to uh, put this policy uh, to work and becomes effective uh, even today or by tomorrow anyway, I suppose. So, uh, and I did hear you say, my question was uh, uh, if there's some areas that uh, uh, you can go to work uh, right away. I believe I heard you say that we, we're not having to wait for petitions uh, to come in before uh, we, we uh, start some of this, is that right? That's right. We do have uh, four, actually, that are in progress within uh, Eagle Ridge subdivision at this time. Okay. All right. Okay, Council, um, you've heard the presentation uh, almost twice now, I guess. Uh, and uh, so uh, a motion would be in order at this time. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the updated and revised traffic calming policy. Okay. Thank you. Okay, motion properly made and seconded by Mr. Singleton and uh, uh, seconded by uh, Mr. Vance. Any other question or comment before we vote? Okay, hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Vote aye if you approve, vote no if you don't. Councilmember Vance? Aye. Mayor Pro Tim Berenger? Aye. Councilmember Dellinger? Aye. Councilmember Matthews? 
Aye. Councilmember Singleton. Aye. Okay, thank you very much, Council. Um, obviously, the motion uh, passes unanimously, and so the um, uh, this proposed traffic calming policy is adopted effective immediately. Mr. Johnson, I want to thank you for your uh, work on this, and uh, a good good job, I think, of, uh, of doing uh, something that's uh, been needed for a while, and sounds like in some ways uh, it's uh, pretty consistent with what some of our neighboring municipalities are doing. Um, so... Uh, Hopefully it'll uh, work better and make our town even a safer place. So thank you, sir. And thank you to council and, and as well as the members of the public works committee. It was quite a quite a way to get here, and and we appreciated all the feedback. It was made the whole process go a lot smoother and make sure it's comprehensive. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, council. I believe uh, unless you want to take a break right now, we could uh, at least go. We have. Maybe just one committee report. Speaking of the Public Works Committee, it looks like a report from Public Works. Um, who's prepared to give that? Mr. Mayor, um, th we actually were um, have sent some information out to the Public Works Committee to either get their input on or schedule a meeting, so we actually don't have a report tonight. We were just going to uh, let the council know that we are working on something that will come back to them possibly as early as the next meeting once we either meet with the committee or receive feedback from them. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, are there any other committee reports at this time? Uh, maybe I should mention, by the way, that the, the committee that was named to uh, look at honoring our former mayor through a uh, renaming policy uh, did meet with a, uh, a design, I don't know what we call them, a design consultant this past week to talk about some logistics uh, of um, of how that recognition would be put into practice uh, there in the council chambers and certainly in the forum area. And so um, we've got them working on some uh, ideas that were suggested and we would anticipate uh, having uh, some information back in the fairly near future. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a design group that I believe the town worked with before in putting up uh, some of the other um, uh, signage or not signage, but uh, other Stable. kinds of yeah, sketches or whatever. Yep. So, um, so we have a lot of confidence in them. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, bring that back to you at a, at a future time. Uh, any anything else the committee members want to mention about that? Kathy and Gray are serving on that. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, if you're ready to uh, move right along, uh, I believe we can certainly cover uh, manager reports. Mr. Dixon, are you ready, sir? Yes, Mr. Mayor, Town Council, you have um, Garner info in your packet, and I know, uh, Mr. Mayor, you asked for an update on one of the items in there as it pertains to um, some flooding, ponding of water on the road near uh, Avisboro, and I guess the Walgreens. Um, yes. Public Works staff did look at that issue, although that's a state road. What they found was one of the inlet pipes on the undeveloped property across the street had been overtaken by uh, vegetation, so they were able to clean that out uh, to get that water running off the road. Um, they feel like that's gonna make it better. And then there was another pipe they cleaned out. It'll make it better, but um, it will not be perfect until that property probably is developed and um, the water is channeled in a different way. But um, I think that pipe can handle most of your regular capacity, but when you have a really hard rain, sometimes it, it doesn't keep up. But but we think for now it'll be a lot better than it was. Okay, and thank you, uh, Mr. Dixon, for that. Yeah, I had noted that uh, uh, dated back uh, several months and I uh, just wanted to make sure we were not letting that slip. So uh, thank you for that uh, report, sure enough. Yeah. The uh, second okay. there had okay. to do COVID testing and vaccines, and I don't have a lot of update on that yet. I was just kind of hoping we can maybe get some numbers on how successful the uh, vaccine drive was um, last week. I know they had a really busy first day and I think maybe it continued on. Uh, the weather made it pretty tough. Um, I know they ended up canceling Sunday due to the uh, the, um, the weather, uh, but overall, um, I, I think they would probably say it was a success as long as they got more people vaccinated. Um, I'm sorry, not vaccinated, tested. That was a testing event, not a vaccination event. Don't want to get them mixed up. Um, on the testing, uh, Wake County is continuing to kind of give us updates, um, biweekly updates on testing. Um, I know last report there are going to be more um, vaccines 
uh, distributed by the state. It is a state run program and rules. Uh, and they are, um, got a program where they went from a, a group kind of targeting test, uh, va a group targeted vaccination program to an individual program. So basically they were asking uh, anyone in the um, categories that they released uh, as far as the started with the over 75 your healthcare workers and then it went to your 65 and older uh, to register online. And so they it went to a, a self initiated um, process. Uh, and then they are trying to get those vaccinations out as quick as they can uh, as supplies allow them to. But it, but it has been a challenge. And I, but that's the case throughout the state and the nation, I would say. Um, the demand is much greater than the supply right now. Um, wanted to mention the GPAC at home series. Uh, that's been um, fairly successful. We got a lot of um, shows lined up for the rest of the season. Um, you may have gotten a flyer um, in your mail that has some of the, uh, the acts that are coming on board. Uh, the most recent one was a tribute to um, Mahalia Jackson, and we had our own Garner Neil Pageant and uh, Mary Williams uh, do that tribute, and it was very good. And we have just a variety of um, talent here, um, all different types of genres there. So happy to have that. The other thing is I did send you a retreat agenda. Uh, at our last discussion, there was some um, suggestion that there be more time devoted to the bond. I think we start off the retreat talking about visioning and strategic plan, and then take that information and tie it into uh, bond prioritization and uh, spend some time on the second day um, looking at what some of the projects are. We've, we've done a, a, um, a presentation on the CIP. Now we want to narrow down what the uh, prevailing projects will be for the, um, the bond issue and talk about uh, the magnitude of the bond program and the dollar amount, and then how we're going to divide it up amongst the several questions um, and categories. So you have that. So if you have any questions, just feel free to contact me and I can um, try to answer those for you. Any questions anybody have right now about any of that? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to council members uh, uh, in just a quick moment, but um, I wanted to, uh, to note that I still have a strong interest in uh, uh, having a vaccination site in our town. Um, I haven't been successful yet in having a commitment on that, but I have talked to uh, the chairman of the county commissioners and expressed that interest, and he's uh, promised to look into that. I did recently talk with, um, also, I believe it's a fairly new uh, director of uh, human services, I believe, Ms. Uh, Bowler. I talked to her, well, I talked to her office this past week, and again, uh, made that known uh, again no no firm commitment but an idea to uh, look at that uh, obviously as you noted mr manager there have been some challenges in the initial rollout so um at this point there they're working through some of those but uh it would be preferable in my view if at some point uh, we had a site uh, closer to our good citizens uh, here in garner for sure um and on the testing, uh, I was in the park uh, on the day they were out there. It was a cold day, and God bless them, they were sort of huddled around. They weren't so busy when I was by there, but I did stop by and thank them uh, for their uh, willingness to be out there. And so um, and certainly that was a site that was right here in Garner, so people who wanted to be tested could be. It was uh, fairly convenient for them. Um, yeah, Mr. Right, Mayor, that, right before you got there, they had over uh, 200 cars to go through there oh, that, okay. that morning. Yes, yeah, all right. Yeah, it was a little later in the day when I was uh, by there, sure enough. So uh, so thank you and uh, others uh, who were involved uh, with uh, uh, having having them come to our town, sure enough. Um, all right, uh, council members, any questions for the uh, town manager in regards to uh, items on his report? Um, I'll just give it a free reign. If anybody has one, just jump in. Okay, hearing none, um, we'll move to uh, any reports from our town attorney. Uh, are there any? I, I don't have a formal report tonight. I am working on compiling information at um, Councilman Dellinger's request regarding the town's ability to adopt any LGBTQ type policies or ordinances. So 
uh, stay tuned. You'll get something um, on that in the future. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, we spoke as well, and uh, there's some uh, other case or case law uh, being developed out there or is out there, and, and I appreciate uh, uh, your um, your research on that, sure enough. Um, council, we'll do a round robin on council reports at this time. I'll start with uh, Ms. Beringer. I don't have anything this week, sir. Okay. Mr. Singleton. I'm good for right now, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Vance. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to reiterate in reference to what I said at the last meeting pertaining to the trash around town. It yes. appears that the trash is beginning to build up around town. And I uh, just want to know what can be done about that in the future. Thank you, Mr. Vance. And uh, if you saw, there's an article in today's In the Know about that. Uh, uh, city of Raleigh and the several other municipalities, I think, are experiencing some of the same issues, and there's a real concern on that. Um, I, I want to get back to the well to the town manager and maybe our public work director and kick around some ideas of something uh, we uh, some things we might consider. Uh, it's something I believe maybe a couple meetings ago I said I had some strong interest in. I, I do come in, and I know there are any number of citizens uh, who are trying to do their part. Some who uh, or walking for exercise or other reasons, and uh, I know some of them take along uh, trash bags with them and pick up trash as they go, which is very commendable. Um, but we need to probably try to uh, do something uh, in a more formal fashion to uh, to address that. So um, it's certainly on my my list of things uh, to uh, to look at further. Um, okay, let me see who was next. I've forgotten who I've called on. Mr. Matthews, I guess. Nothing this time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dellinger. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just would like to note that today is the first day of Black History Month. Um, and for everyone to take pause and remember and learn about uh, African American history, because that's American history, and it's probably a lot of history we didn't get to learn in school. So take the opportunity to uh, learn more about uh our country's history and you can better appreciate how far we've come as a country and how far we have yet to go. So I say, uh, educate yourself beyond what you think, you know, and what you want to believe. So take this time to learn a little bit more American history. Um, my other uh, thing is and I, I was on Garner road uh, last night. It had rained a lot and there was pooled water across from the cement fact plant over there on Garner Road. It was pooled on the north side of Garner Road, well over halfway, probably about halfway through the road. And there were cars having to veer to miss it. So they were going into the other traffic, which reminded me that on New Christmas Eve, we were driving down Garner Road. And I believe we saw the aftermath of an accident where a tractor trailer mirror had clipped another car because it was trying to miss this huge puddle that was in Garner Road right there. Um, so if we could get, I know it's a DOT road, but if we could get someone to look at that, um, it's really, really dangerous because people are ver veering into oncoming traffic, trying not to hit that standing water when it rains really heavily. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all I've got. Okay. Thank you, sir. I will back up uh, what Mr. Delver just said. That is correct. It was there last week. It's there when it rains heavily. It runs uh, the road slants from the south to the north right there, and uh, the edge of the road has built up so that the water has no place to go. There's a lot of dirt, kind of a sandy dirt, kind of a, a sandy uh, uh, layer there, and uh, the, D Damien's right. And there used to, there's a street light there that needs to be uh, replaced also. There's a street light on one of those poles that has gone dark. There's three or four there on Garner Road, uh, and it's right at that area too, so that doesn't help. But he is correct. The water does pool there pretty bad now. Thank you, Ms. Singleton. Okay. Um, I believe, did I cover all the council members? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yeah. A point here. Mr. Dellinger reminded me of something I should have already said uh, regarding Black History Month. It's just a, a bit of humor. Greensboro is my hometown. And uh, when my, one of my sons was in college there and we rode down Main Street, one day and he pointed out what used to be Woolworths and uh, 
excuse me, K Jewelers, and he said, that's where they had the sit-in mom all those years ago. I said, no, that was a jewelry store. Woolworths was next door. And he said, no, mom, no, it was right there on the corner where the jewelry store is now. And I again said, no, it was next door. We went through this again, and finally I said, I was there. Um, he was shocked, but I remember very well when uh, that took place, and it was it was a great day. So thank you for bringing that up, Damien. Thank you, and I would note that if our Senior Citizens uh, Center were open, I know in the past uh, there's always been some uh, recognition. The mayor and others have been invited over there. I'm going to miss that this year because of COVID-19, but uh, um, yeah, it is uh, certainly a Worthy, worthy of note, and uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, something I'm going to uh, mention that is uh, uh, maybe some would say is more on the frivolous side, but uh, don't forget, by the way, that um, tomorrow is Groundhog Day, and uh, th th this this town has had a tradition of the mayor conferring with the uh, with Mortimer, our groundhog, to get a prediction and. In spite of COVID-19, I'm, I'm pleased to report to you that the mayor did have uh, a virtual meeting uh, with this mammal a few days ago. It was all recorded, um, and he um, he did give me a prediction, uh, which I will not tell you about tonight. I'll wait to know. It'll be played, I guess, sometime tomorrow. But uh, So in spite of COVID, uh, Mortimer and the mayor... Uh, did have their interaction uh, on, on a virtual basis. So uh, we're going forth with that, all right? Um, that'll give you something to think about tonight as you're trying to get to sleep, I'm sure. It's on my uh, calendar. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. We, started, uh, we started out here with Mr. Dellinger so elegantly, elegantly talking about today being February 1st in Black History Month, and now we're down to uh, <laughs> Aaron and Gopher. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> things are things are things are headed in the wrong direction. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's time to I'm going to. Uh, I think that probably deserves a quick um, um, pause here. I'm going to suggest we take a uh, a five minute uh, break, and when we come back, we'll finish off our uh, agenda at that time. Okay, Mr. Mayor, do we need, do we need a motion to go into closed session first? Um, I guess we could do that, uh, Mr. Turner. Yeah, I guess can we can we make the motion and, and have a uh, uh, have a pause and uh, then come back to that? Yes, you can go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right, Mr. Mayor, think... I'll, I'll make the motion if that's appropriate. Yeah. Pursuant to NC General Statute Section 143-318. 11A5 to discuss possible real estate acquisition in the town's negotiating position regarding such real estate and section 143.318.11A6 to discuss the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, or conditions of, of appointment of an individual public officer or employee. Okay, motion properly made. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Matthews seconded that. Um, Ms. Gibson, would you uh, call the roll of vote on that? Yes, sir. Mayor Pro Tim Berenger? Aye. Councilmember Dellinger? Aye. Councilmember Matthews? Aye. Councilmember Singleton? Aye. And Councilmember Vance? Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will. Um, we will take a brief uh, recess. I'm suggesting about five minutes and give uh, uh, our technical people an opportunity to uh, get us set up for the closed session. And so uh, I'll, uh, yeah, we'll back to order in about five minutes. So council will take your break now and I'll see you just briefly. Okay, um, Council, I declare we're back into uh, our regular open session. The uh, Council met in closed session uh, to discuss a possible real estate acquisition and had discussion with town staff in regards to uh, uh, 
uh, that issue and uh, we exchange information and the um, uh, staff will uh, be reporting back at a later date in regards to that issue. We also uh, had a report from the town manager in regards to uh, a personnel issue that the uh, uh, council uh, received and uh, uh, further uh, uh, further action on, on, on that item will be uh, uh, forthcoming to the council uh, sometime within the next couple of months. Um, so with that, council, that concludes our agenda. Are there any other items that need to come before us at this time? If not, I will entertain a motion that we uh, adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, uh, I'll ask the town clerk to call the roll on the final uh, vote tonight. <laughs> Councilmember Dellinger? Aye. Councilmember Matthews? Aye. Councilmember Singleton? Aye. Councilmember Vance? Nay. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Air <Aircraft> and Perry. <laughs> okay. Um, I declare that um, um, I think four of our council members can go home and Mr. Uh, Vance can stay up for a while. There you go. Stay up. <laughs> yeah. Good night. Uh, no, no. Thank, thank right you very here, much, sir. council. Stay right here. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you for your time. Um, these virtual meetings uh, will need to continue for yet a while longer, so I appreciate your indulgence and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you at our uh, next uh, meeting, and I'm sure I'll see some of you about town. Stay safe and be well, and uh, uh, remember, uh, you know, today started Black History Month, so uh, uh, do your best to, to be informed and to participate as you have opportunity to do so. So with that, I will say uh, good night to you all and uh, see you uh, soon. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.